Well, hello and happy Thursday night. Sorry to be a little late. I am a lone dad tonight. My wife is picking up her aunt at the airport. And I've had two kids for a long time, and I don't have those muscles the way that my wife does, and I don't know how anybody does it. Um, I'm more tired than I've ever been. But hello, welcome. It's great to see you. My name is Jeff Howard. I'm a writer from shows like Haunting of Hill House and Midnight Mass, and you might know me from movies like Oculus and Ouija Origin of Evil. And tonight, I just want to talk to you about something really quick. Um, when I was starting out, there were about 7,263 things that I didn't know. Uh, but tonight, I just want to take a minute and talk to you Plus about the fourth anniversary. That's true. All right, big guy. I want to talk to you tonight about five things I absolutely wish I'd known when five. I was starting out in this job. What? Five, five things. How many things? Five. Right. And how, what are they? They're things I wish I'd known when I started screenwriting. So the first thing that I really wish that somebody had clued me in on before I started working in this job is exactly how deals work. My very first deal was a feature spec screenplay sold to Sony in July of 1999. Um, I had a great time writing it. I had a great time meeting all the people. I was not at all prepared for what was going to happen afterwards. I knew there'd be percentages taken out for the, you know, for agent and manager. And I knew that, you know, there might be other stuff to look at and think. But what I didn't realize was when I got a check that I was expecting to be about $75,000, and it was about $13,000 that I understood that there were things I did not know about this business. Um, and that's something that I wish I'd known. I'd wish I'd known that when you sell a spec or anything else, that those checks come in chunks, usually in four pieces, sometimes even in six or more. Um, I wish I'd have known they'd be divided up evenly like that, and they'd be months spread months apart, so I could have planned my life a little better. Uh, I wish I knew exactly how much they would be taking out of those checks, but there is nobody and no thing, especially at that time, that prepares you for the hardcore economic realities of what's going to happen once you sign one of these deals. Um, I watched a writing team who I worked with on a series uh, who were former lawyers who uh, they gave us our checks on the first week. I think they just wanted to impress us and give us our checks in person. And I watched one of the two of them across the table from me open up his check and look at it. And I saw his soul leave his body when he realized just how small it actually was for that week of TV writing. Um, I don't think that was the fantasy. But yeah, if there's one thing that I wish I knew uh, before I started and that I wish each and every one of you would know, it's how deals work, how they take six, eight, 10, 12 weeks to make, sometimes six months, sometimes eight months these days. I've heard crazy horror stories, just like at the airport, you hear horror stories, you hear horror stories about deals getting made. Um, so much that I wish I'd known, but alas, nobody talks about it, but we definitely talk about it here and we talk about it on our Zoom. So we're trying to get people prepared for things like that. The second thing that I wish I'd known before I started, um, back when I was starting to be a screenwriter, I really wish I knew to be bright enough to diversify my career between television and features right away. Um, I focused on features for years and years. I felt like TV was a closed party that you get invited to. And it turned out that really is largely the case, but I really could have sat down and followed a path where I could have had a simultaneous career much earlier than I did. And I firmly believe that, especially in the year 2023, if you don't have your, your one foot in features and one foot in TV at any given time, you could be facing the dreaded interruption of service of getting paid. Uh, one of the most important things is if you've got your foot in both sides, features and TV, if one of them flakes out, the other one is always there for you. Um, if they both are going great, you're having a wonderful time. If they both flake out, oh, welcome to the last three years, I suppose, right? Um, it's a strange new world, but I really believe when it comes to survival, if I'd have known when I was first starting out that my chances of success would be much greater if I focused on features and TV, I would have done it a lot earlier. I really made a terrible mistake by doing that. Um, and I really hope that you don't repeat that one. Third thing that I wish I'd known before I started working as a screenwriter, I wish I knew when I started exactly how small the town is. And when people say that, they don't mean Los Angeles because Los Angeles is huge. They mean the business and the and the industry and all and of that stuff. I didn't tell you you're working by member by lucky members. Oh yeah, Sam wanted to pop That's by and say, don't forget that you got to watch his video because Daddy is just lapping him on views. He's a he's at a sad ninety one. Yeah, anyway, and, 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 <laughs> and I don't watch members, everyone. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about some numbers on a video soon. Anyway, that's what happens when mommy is out picking up her aunt at the airport. 
Uh, but they said, you know, add a little cute appeal. So here we go. So third thing I wish I'd have known when I was starting out as a screenwriter, I really wish somebody had clued me in at the time about how small the industry is. Everybody knows everybody. If you're talking to somebody, everybody they know has heard about it. And the assistant that works for them has told every assistant that they know. And there's nothing that's going to happen in this town without everybody knowing about it. If you I really screwed myself up in my very early days. I was lucky enough to have a really wonderful person named Lee Keel who worked at the Gersh Agency at the time. And this was like 25 years ago. I know she's still there and I think she's a big agent now. Um, I'd love to track her down and say hi. But at the time, I was a brand new fresh starting writer and she did what was called hip pocketing me. She worked, read my script, liked it, couldn't put me on her roster yet because I wasn't making any money, but she was very helpful in spreading the word and getting out to people and sending me out to meetings and all that stuff. And I thought, hey, this is great. I've got this hip pocket agent. Little did I know at the time, while I was out there trying to find a full-time agent, that I my mentioning to people that I was being hip pocketed by a certain person would really just en end up resulting in them sending me a very terse email about how I'd really screwed them up by uh, making it known out there that this arrangement existed. And so my naivete and my lack of ability to understand just how small the town was and how when you're talking to one person in this town, you're really talking to everybody in this town, uh, cost me that arrangement and uh, cost me a couple of years of waiting for more representation. So if I had been starting out and somebody had bothered to clue me in on exactly how small this town was, how when you talk to somebody, you're really talking to everybody, how if you slip a script to one person, their assistant is going to read it and put it on a database and every other assistant in the town is going to know what they thought about it and, wh and when they got it, um, I would have gone about things different. So it's a small town. Keep that in mind. Um, just know it every single day as you're dealing with people that everyone knows everyone and they're all talking whether you know it or not. Um, another huge lesson, which I fortunately never learned the hard way because I think I was kind of raised uh, properly in a way where you really treat people well. But I had a writing partner when I first started in this job who would really be hard on assistance, not in an overt jerk way, but in the way of saying things like, you know, could you make me a brand new pot of just really hot black coffee or things like that when they would ask him what a drink he wanted or he would say, uh, you know, do you, do you have any great knee high? Is there any way that we could get some? And it would be like, oh my God, why are you making these demands of this assistant? The fourth thing I wish I'd really known when I was starting out screenwriting is that today's assistant is tomorrow's senior vice president of production. And the person bringing you water today in three months could be the person that you're coming into pitch and getting nervous about meeting. And guess what? They remember the people who mistreat them. So if you are out there and you're talking to assistants in these rooms as you're getting to know people and you're mistreating these assistants or you're being a jerk or you're being a diva or divo either way, um, you are most likely shooting yourself in the foot for that time later on when you have to go pitch that person for a job. So always keep it in mind. Never be phony with them. Just be real with them. That's all they want. Um, a nice, fair, even real exchange. Um, <clears throat> so it's really important to know. Uh, fourth thing that I wish I knew when I was starting out as a screenwriter. The fifth one, the last one I'll talk about tonight that I wish I'd really known um, when I was starting out as a screenwriter I did not understand the full depths of which the fantasy doesn't quite live up to the actual day-to-day -day job in one very specific way. Because let me tell you something, the fantasy lives up to the job in almost every single way all the time. But there's one thing that I just never realized, and that was that in order to spend 25% of my life sitting and typing and very happily having a good time doing my job, I have to spend about 75% of my life in a mixture of high school speech class and used car sales. Uh, I don't think there's a writer out there who ever said, I'm going to work really hard, start a writing career, get known, get my stuff out there, start making money and get some things made specifically so that I can go to places and pitch and that I can feel like I'm in sales and used car sales and that I can spend every day with the same sweaty armpits that I had back in uh, high school for a speech class. Yet, here we are. The real reality of the screenwriter job is you will spend most of your time searching for jobs. And searching for jobs is a combination of high school speech class because you got to give those pitches to people. You got to talk to people. You got to be ready at a moment's notice to step up to the plate. And you've also got to go out there and do your used car sales. You got to be the person that you never anticipated yourself being, which is a salesperson. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Say Anything, there's a hilarious scene in it where John Cusack is talking about 
what he doesn't want to do after high school, how he doesn't want to manufacture anything, produce or produce anything for manufacturing or any of those kind of things. And it's exactly the feeling that you get with, with this. What? What? Whose mom's life? Whose mom's life? No, why? Mom's wife? Oh my goodness. Are you telling people here live on YouTube that mommy has a wife? Uh-oh. This is a hell of a thing for daddy to find out. So anyway, obviously what we'll deal with this as a family a and we'll husband. get past it. <laughs> wow, it's all happening. All right. So what's that fifth thing? The real reality is to get that 25% of your life where you're going to sit in that room and type and really be happy and live your bliss, you're going to spend 75% of your time in meetings. You're going to spend 75% of your time pitching, putting together pitch docs, talking to people that you never thought you'd have to talk to. Uh, but that is the job. So five things that I really wish I had known before I started doing this job. Um, I'm sure that the heavily sound quality of my great editor, Ken Blackwell, will be knocking out Sammy's voice from this thing anytime. And the whole thing will be perfectly crystal clear without him, right? This is, yeah, this is my spell. This is your spells? Are you a witch? All right. So if anybody's got any questions, I'm going to sit around for a minute or two and see if any of them are there. Otherwise, I'm going to roll and hang with these boys and let them do their thing while we wait for mommy to get back from the airport. Uh, yeah, but please take a look. Yeah, this yeah. video will be up on YouTube. As difficult as it will be to watch, it should still be uh, well, at least moderately know. informational with many more to come. So don't worry. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. It's the end of Roger Rabbit. Oh, the hyenas are laughing. What's going to happen? Oh, no. All right. Listen, um, our writer's room's getting smaller. Uh yeah, you know, um, I, I'm in one now, or well, I was in one until the strike started. That was five writers and three support people. Uh, and, you know, it's just because they want to spend less money and stuff like that. Um, I, I guess they're working on some mandates now. That'll change those rules. Uh, and hopefully they'll get them. But if they don't, it's always hard for writers. It's always hard to get it done. But the real reality is, the job is fun. I mean, I, I know we're, we're really stuck in a strike mode right now, and we're stuck in this place where a lot of people are very down on everything and very worried about the future. And I definitely have those moments too. But the real reality is, yes, the real reality is things have, see what I mean? If my son proves anything to you tonight, it's that rooms are always, rooms. Life is always hard for writers. It's always seemed like an easy cush job, but there's actually a lot of behind the scenes stress and a lot of worries and I don't know a writer who doesn't lie awake staring up at the ceiling uh, at nights, you know, several months out of the year, uh, worried and everything. So, um, but it's the up okay. I can make you pillow the pillow for it. You gonna make a pillow for it? Yeah. Awesome. You're not gonna beat me to death with those pillows, are you? Why? I'm too nice a guy. Um, <sighs> anyway, lately I've been taking a lot of beatings from pillows. Uh, I'm just gonna look at a couple of more of these questions. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I've been told to focus on one type of writing. Uh, narrative. How do you move back and forth? Like, listen, I, I don't think if you are a pre WGA person and you're starting your career, I don't think you got to stick to one thing. I think you can write whatever the best thing you've got at the time is, whatever the thing that most burns in your soul and you're going to do the best job with is the one you should write. The first one you sell is going to be your shingle. It's going to be your niche for a little while. It's going to be the, the zone that they, you know, plug you in and expect you to stay in. And as a writer, it's fine. It's, you know, being stuck as a writer doing one type of movie or one type of TV show over and over and over again still beats the best job out there that there is. But that being said, if you fear that and truly fear it, as a writer, there's a great mechanism that you can use, which is if you decide you want to make a change to your career later on and switch gears and do something um, different in style, like different kind of writing, uh, different kinds of movies, different kinds of TV, you can. You just have to write it as a spec and make it great and now get it out there in the world of people that you've created who know you for the other stuff. And they won't pay you at first to write this new thing, but they will read it. And if it's good, they'll buy it and they'll make it. You know what I mean? Um, so transitioning as a writer from one sort of genre to another or one sort of shingle to another, it's not as hard as you think, but you actually, you do have to do the work um, and, and sort of recreate yourself. But hey, at least we can. Most directors don't get that opportunity to really recreate themselves. So it's the one place where we're a little more flexible uh, in that area. Reaction to Maureen's Ryan, Maureen Ryan's excerpt in Vanity Fair. Um, I mean, I, I can't say I was shocked but I was sad to see how the lost room went um, and sad to see some people who I really admire on Twitter 
uh, like that great writer, Javi, um, who just apparently just had a miserable experience. And I just hate to think about it because I, I remember seeing his name on the credits in like 2006 or whatever that it was and thinking, wow, you know, um, what a great job and what a great thing. And it's just a shame that a few people, I, old school showrunners and the people who usually have become old school showrunners really suffer from an ego problem where they need to build a little cult of personality and have people bring them the brown M&Ms and have three different assistants and have everybody telling them they're king and feel like they're really lording over something and all that stuff. And I, I, I just think that kind of showrunner is going to go out like the way that, you know, Model T cars and all those kind of things eventually went out. It'll just go out of style. And we'll have a much more fair, equitable place where people really just want to show up all day and do the job. You know what I mean? Like that is the absolute best way to go. Um, if you just show up caring about the job, kind of like we have it in this witch's room that's uh, you know on hold now for the strike, everybody showed up and just came every day wanting to play. And that's what you want to do um, to get focused on all those things, to, to build a little cult of personality, to want to be king, to want to be treated so great. It's such a waste of time. It's like... I really caution people all the time. Try to get your self-esteem and your happiness from something other than the industry that you're working in, and you'll be a much more satisfied person. Um, if you're a fan of classic Hollywood, I recommend Max Wilk's books, Schmucks with Underwoods, all interviews with screenwriters from the side of Hollywood through the 60s. Great read. It sounds awesome. Um, great title. Uh, I would have loved to have been one of those. My my one and only singular life fantasy is that I could have sort of somehow land in 1938 with a weekly deal at Paramount or Warner's turning in my pages every week and uh, hoping for the best that the director didn't screw them up when the picture started and that we didn't get George Raff, that we got Bogart and all that stuff. Biggest fantasy I've ever had in my life. I would love to see it come true. I found a book called Time on My Hands that I got the rights to, which is pretty much that fantasy played out. Um, and uh, it's really fun. It's got a great other plot. So... Listen, I really wanted to pop in and uh, I've any questions that are here before I wrap up, I will definitely do. But I really just wanted to pop in and really just sort of talk about uh, if you got here late, I hope you can take a look at it when we put it up here on YouTube. Just five things that I really wish I'd known before I started doing this job. Um, there are 40 of them so far on a list that I've made of similar things. I, I just sort of wanted to run through the first five with you tonight and see what you think. Um, really appreciate everybody. Really appreciate you turning up here. We're going to be continue to do this every single week. Um, I'm going to show up usually for an hour. I'm going to go a little shorter tonight just because of the obvious children, background noise, terror show of watching my kids alone and trying to do this. But um, I just want to say really appreciate everyone here. Really appreciate the audience. Really appreciate you spreading the word about the YouTube channel. And don't forget, we have our Zooms, info at jhsessions.com. Info at jhsessions.com is the email. You write Marsha there. She can send you a schedule of all the things we do. Uh, much longer Zooms about topics, much longer programs about how to get into things like writing a pilot, writing a screenplay. Um, very happy to be there. Uh, love to stay an hour. Next week, I'm going to have a special guest, and we will talk to her for the entire hour. Um, and we're going to have a really good time with that. She's a great writer who's making a big splash right now, and I think everybody's going to enjoy her. Until then... Great to see everybody. I hope you have a great week. Please continue. We have a brand new video coming up uh, tomorrow or the next day, a brand new produced video all about um, the crazy way that I sold my very first screenplay. Um, unrepeatable, strange story uh, that I really hope you enjoy. Um, and many more YouTube videos coming soon. So thanks for being here. I'll be back next Thursday at the same time. We'll do an hour. I'm going to have a special guest who you will love. Appreciate you all. Have a great night. Thank you so much.